Hi, I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, indictments are handed down in a South Bay corruption case with hundreds of charges filed. And a controversial San Diego attorney is now on the other side of the bench. What can we expect from Judge Gary Creep? And from access to contraception to most social media restrictions at work, we'll explain a few of the hundreds of new California state laws. Then we talk with one of the thousands of married couples who will be affected by a new change in immigration policy. I'm Peggy Pico with those stories just ahead. And he traveled the state in search of California's gold for public television. Huel Hauser has died. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by Good evening. Thanks for joining us. A corruption case involving South Bay school officials is getting bigger. A grand jury has handed down indictments against 15 people in what District Attorney Bonnie Dumanis calls a pay-to-play scheme involving gifts in exchange for votes on school contracts. The case involves current and former officials with Sweetwater Union High School District, San Ysidro School District, and Southwestern Community College. Fifteen defendants face 232 charges, including bribery and perjury. The possible penalties could include prison terms of six months to seven years and a lifetime ban from public office. Now, most of the defendants were in court today, but had their arraignments put off until the end of the month so they could review the charges. On March 26, the U.S. Supreme Court will hear oral arguments over California's ban on same-sex marriage. The justices have scheduled one hour of arguments in a case first filed in 2009. A federal appeals court has already said Proposition 8 is unconstitutional. Now, the day after the Prop 8 arguments, the court is scheduled to hear the case over the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. It currently denies federal benefits to legally married same-sex couples. Some San Diegans will go to the polls twice in March. The state scheduled a March 12th special election to replace Juan Vargas in the assembly. And today, the city of San Diego scheduled another special election on March 26th to replace Councilman Tony Young. City leaders had looked at consolidating the elections. It would have saved about $100,000, but council members felt the earlier date wouldn't give potential candidates enough time. I, Gary Creep, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear, swear that I will support and defend, that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of California. Gary Creep was one of three new San Diego Superior Court judges sworn in today. He made his headlines, he actually made headlines last year when he told KPBS he had serious doubts about whether President Obama was a U.S. citizen. My news source reporter Ryan Grohowski was at the swearing-in ceremony earlier today. She joins us in the news center. Uh, Ryan, Judge Creep has been known as an activist. Are there concerns about his objectivity? Well, as an attorney, Creep has taken up many conservative causes. In fact, he petitioned the Supreme Court to investigate President Obama's eligibility to hold office. But now he's on the other side of the bench, and Judge David Danielson, who swore Creep in today, made a point of saying that the ceremony marked a transition for Creep. He must now be an advocate for justice only. And did Judge Creep make any comments of his own? Very few. He said he was nervous as his fiancée helped him put his robe on after he took his oath. He also thanked those in attendance and asked for their prayers that God would guide him to be just and fair. And who were the other two judges sworn in today? Bob Amador, who won over Jim Miller Jr. in November, took his oath today, as well as David Berry, who won in the June primary. The judges report to work tomorrow. Uh, Amador is in family court, Berry is in criminal, and Creep is in misdemeanors. The judges will rotate through different assignments through the first few months to gain experience. I News Source reporter Ryan Grohowski. This was an historic day at the County Board of Supervisors. The first new face elected in nearly two decades was sworn in. Dave Roberts replaces Pam Slater Price in District 3 in the North County. She is stepping down after serving for 20 years. Today we turn the page to a new chapter 
in the 162 year history book of San Diego County. I'm the first new supervisor in 18 years, the first member of that next generation of leaders on our county board of supervisors. Roberts got a standing ovation from the crowd at the new county operations center. Not only is he a new face on the board, he's the first Democrat since 1995. Supervisors Greg Cox and Diane Jacob were also sworn in for their fifth and sixth full terms, respectively. Cox expects to become the board chair for this year. San Diego Mayor Bob Filner introduced his top staff to the public today. 24 people in all. About half worked for Filner before, during his city council and congressional days. Filner is stressing the diversity of the group. More than half are women, about a third are Latino, and nearly a quarter are African American. Uh, I made a, uh, a, a simple campaign pledge that we would change the face of City Hall, uh, bringing in the full diversity of the community. And I think uh, the diversity of the city, uh, of this nation, is uh, reflected in the staff behind me. Staff salaries will range from 25000 a year for a mayoral assistant to 185000 for the assistant chief operating officer. Well, hello everybody, I'm Hewell Hauser, and here we are at the fair. You know, there's 78 fairs in California, fairs that take place all over our state. With a Tennessee twang and a never-ending sense of wonder, Huel Hauser took us all over California, bringing us new stories of old familiar places and showing us things we'd never seen before. Hauser died of natural causes early this morning in Palm Springs. He retired just last month after years of hosting programs like California's Gold on KPBS and other public television stations around the state. Joining me now from the News Center is Keith York, former KPBS TV programming director and longtime colleague and friend of Huel Hauser. Keith, thanks for joining us. Why was Hauser so appealing as a host and interviewer? Well, I think he was arguably the first person doing what he was doing anywhere in the state of California outside of commercial local news. Um, with the sensibility of Charles Kuralt, he was on public broadcasting stations uh, statewide. So being first at, uh, first at bat here uh, made him unique, but certainly his style uh, the type of show he produced, I mean, just about everything surrounding the aura of California's gold uh, during its entire lifespan uh, was unique. Yeah, and Hauser was known for his wide-eyed curiosity. Was, was it genuine, or do you think it was part of the show? You know, as a, as a friend and a colleague of his for many years, uh, I think that was probably the most often asked question of me, even if he was nearby and within uh, earshot of such a question. Is that real? Is that really him? Is that really his his personality and strangely yes uh, he woke up every morning and if we spoke on the phone or or saw each other here in San Diego or up in Los Angeles uh, that tenor uh, that persona that he drove home uh, into people's homes uh, was unflinching and, and it never ended it never ceased uh, he never had a, a guard to drop down that was that truly was him and I think uh, everyone that he ever interviewed uh, reacted to that. Uh, the reason he got people to perform for him about uh, whatever it is they were talking about was because on and off camera he was the same guy and very warm and generous with, with, with each interview. Yeah, I did have an opportunity to meet him here at KPBS and I felt that genuineness as well. What do you think his legacy will be for public television? Well, there's certainly big shoes to fill or a void to fill uh, in his absence and his passing um, and, and I think that'll be left for other people to discuss. But I think uh, his legacy is, is uh, certainly in our homes, in our hearts. Uh, those that have his DVDs or, or have some of his programs recorded and they're still watching uh, his, his many years of programs, uh, I think for them it's, it's probably more personal than it is uh, statewide. But certainly he brought to light uh, the many things that uh, we've forgotten that connect all of California, uh, north and south, east and west. Uh, there's a lot of stories in our own backyards that we often forget about and go uncovered by the other uh, media outlets. So I think uh, his legacy is, is what he was able to capture and, and in years to come uh, what we probably need to find new ways to capture. Keith York, former programming director for KPBS, thank you for sharing your memories tonight. My pleasure, Dwayne. No memorial plans have been announced as of yet. Huel Hauser was 67.
The founder of Upper Deck in Carlsbad has died. Richard McWilliam began Upper Deck as a sports trading card business, setting new standards for the collectibles. Upper Deck says McWilliam helped move trading cards from a hobby to a multi-billion dollar industry. In fact, in 1998, he was named one of the most influential people in baseball. He was 59. Some environmental groups say they plan a lawsuit against a desalination plant. It's currently under construction in Carlsbad. The Poseidon plant is expected to turn about 50 million gallons of ocean water into drinking water per day once it reaches full capacity. Environmentalists say it could hurt marine life. They want the output cut to about 15 million gallons a day. California welcomes the new year with lots of new rules, regulations, and laws. Peggy Pico explains a few key changes that will affect nursing mothers, drivers, and employers. As of January 1st, it's against state law to protest near funerals, use dogs to hunt bears, and you can't carry unloaded rifles on city streets. These are just a few of more than 800 new California laws, which include access to contraception and social media restrictions. UC San Diego political science professor Thad Kauser and employment law attorney Dan Eaton are here with details of a few of these new laws that I think a lot of people want to be aware of. Dan, let's start with you. Uh, the latest figures put San Diego's unemployment at around uh, at just a little over 8 percent. What is this new law about social media restriction? Peggy, the new law prohibits employers from requesting or requiring social media passwords or usernames from prospective employees or current employees. It also prohibits employers from requiring their employees to access their personal social media in the employer's presence. It's designed to keep employers from getting information through the back door that they could not ask an applicant, for example, directly, such as information about their marital status, religion, or age, which often is on social media pages. Well, talking about social media, Thad, uh, tell us the law, where it stands right now when it comes to texting in the car. So texting is illegal, but Siri, this is the new Siri law. You can ask Siri or another voice recognition device to send a text for you. So it's hands-free texting is allowed because it, the idea is you won't be looking down at your, at your phone while you're driving. You can just talk your message. So now technology has caught up a little bit with this texting. What about the driverless vehicles? This one had Dan a little bit nervous. <laughs> yeah. So there can will be drones lawsuits? on your highway. Uh, this is something that actually safety advocates and scientists working for a long time on, on having cars be safer, by having lots of sensors, and the idea is computers will be better drivers than we will. And it says that the DMV can now allow some of these driverless cars on the road to do some testing with very clear restrictions on how many can be there. So we're not going to have a fleet of drones on the and I-5 tomorrow. Perhaps location, maybe? Are, are they going to be getting on the um, 8? Or we're not quite sure <laughs> I'm about not that. not sure, but I okay. think they'll not put us All right. in rush hour. Uh, sure. okay, yeah. What about, uh, Dan, let's get back to that workplace. <laughs> he's, he's still quick. <laughs> get off the road into the workplace. Maybe it'll inspire people for uh, public transportation. Or to See? call their lawyer. There we go. <laughs> Speaking of which, in the workplace, there's a new, a uh, couple new anti-discrimination laws. Uh, one is about religious attire at work that stemmed from a, I think, a lawsuit at Disneyland. Tell us about that. Well, it didn't stem from that, but that certainly is the background. The bottom line is now that employers cannot discriminate against employees because of religious attire or because of religious hairstyle. It expands the definition of religious creed to include discrimination against uh, people who wear religious attire or, or if they have their hair for a certain reason, for religious reasons, and also it prohibits discrimination based on religious grooming practices. Right, and I, I believe the, the, the case we're talking about is the woman at Disneyland who wanted to wear her headscarf, correct? Right, who wanted to wear her hijab, and she was going to work at the Storyteller's Cafe, which has an early 1900s theme, and there was some issue about whether she should wear a head covering. She filed that uh, action in August of 2012. That's still pending. And what's interesting about that is that one of the things that employers cannot do under this new law is they cannot accommodate their employer's religious attire by removing them from public contact. Oh, interesting. Okay. There's another one, discrimination, that uh, a lot of people have been talking about, breastfeeding at work. I thought that you, there was already a law saying you couldn't discriminate against Well, that. and the California legislature said so, too. It said it's a declaration of existing law. But now it makes it very clear that employers cannot discriminate against women who breastfeed. They already have to accommodate women who breastfeed by giving them time to do so and by giving them a private space. Now it is very clear under the employment discrimination law that they cannot discriminate against them either. 
in means of they can't shift their uh, their uh, shift work schedule. They they, they can't, can't fire, fire them, them. Okay. demote them, anything like that. That's okay. right. Okay, and Thad, talk to us about, there's a few laws that have changed when it comes to access of contraception mm -hmm. and abortion. What are we looking at there? So the first law allows registered nurses to prescribe contraceptive uh, devices or drugs, and they can do that out of a primary care clinic. So this is designed to increase access to con contraception. And, and the other law, and, and this was one that passed by State Senator Christine Kehoe, who's just term limited out of the legislature, part of her legacy, it, it allows nurses and, and midwives to perform non-surgical abortions uh, for this year and next year. So it's allowing, again, more access. Okay, well, we are out of time. Certainly we couldn't cover all 800s. So Thad Kowser, Dan Eaton, thanks so much for talking with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. State health officials are gearing up to add 1.5 million new patients to Medi-Cal next year under the Affordable Care Act, but the law leaves out Californians' 2 million undocumented immigrants. Our Speak City Heights reporter Megan Burks takes a look at what this means for families with mixed immigration statuses when one sibling can get care and the other cannot. Two months ago, a dentist told Norma Navarro her children had three cavities each. For most parents, the next steps would be routine, book appointments for fillings and prepare a lecture on oral hygiene. For Navarro, it isn't so easy. She and her 10-year-old daughter, Aneth, are in the country illegally. Her seven-year-old son, Angel, was born here. That means Angel is covered by a traditional public health plan, while Aneth gets spotty coverage from the state's Children's Health Development Program. The plan gives her just one month a year to get checkups and follow-up care. Her family's mixed status puts Navarro in a tight spot. For my daughter, they told me they first had to acquire authorization, and for my son, they said, okay, he can come any day. I told them that I elected to wait for my son and to please hurry on the authorization for my daughter, because sometimes my daughter does ask me, why does my brother sometimes get help first, and why don't I? Navarro says her husband is willing to scrape together extra money as a mechanic or borrow from family to pay for out-of-pocket emergency care. But she struggles with the idea of her children receiving unequal preventative care as they grow and develop. This is something that hurts me very much. I would very much like my daughter to have the same kind of privileges that her brother has. For Navarro, navigating the health care system for her children can feel a bit like a Sophie's choice. And the gap between what's available for Aneth and Angel is only slated to grow. While the Affordable Care Act will expand health coverage to millions of currently uninsured Americans, it doesn't extend benefits to the nation's 11 million undocumented immigrants. It will also cut by half the aid to hospitals that serve them. Here's the school-based health clinic. For the nation's undocumented population, little will change. For them, school clinics like this one at Central Elementary School will continue to serve a critical role. City Heights has four of them, and already they're acting as medical homes for students and their siblings, regardless of their immigration status. They're operated by the local Mid-City and La Maestra clinics, but they feel much more like small family practices. What do I do if you say blood sugar instead of blood glucose? Well, the advantage of having a medical home is that you have one place that has all of your medical information and also that you have better follow-up. McLaurin and clinic staff recently saw Navarro's daughter for a speech impediment that had been ignored at her yearly checkups. They immediately set her up with a specialist and are looking into a surgery that could help. They also had Aneth see a psychologist because her classmates are teasing her about the way she talks. Central's principal said she knows that treating undocumented kids like Aneth is a hot-button issue. It invites criticism from people like Pete Nunez. The former U.S. attorney heads a conservative think tank in D.C. called the Center for Immigration Studies. Somebody breaks into my house and, and gets hurt or gets sick. I don't want to have to pay. I shouldn't have to pay for that. So if someone comes here illegally and they get sick or they get injured, why should the American taxpayer pay for that? Emergency treatment for non-urgent illnesses costs taxpayers more than $30 billion annually. 15% of the uninsured obtaining those services are undocumented. Steve Eldred is a program manager for the California Endowment. He says we should consider the cost of denying immigrants preventative care. Health care as a human right, um, yeah, I think it is, is part of the endowment's belief and you know, part of my own, my, my own value system as well. But even if you don't accept that, if you look at it strictly from a cost perspective, by denying people to primary care and, and preventive care, you're, um, 
you're creating a system where they're going to seek the most costly care there is. Eldred helped open City Heights' fourth school clinic in October, and he says two more are in the works. But a big piece of the puzzle is still missing in City Heights and the rest of the nation care for undocumented adults. For that, Eldred says we'll have to look at the bigger picture. Health doesn't come from a doctor's office or from a prescription pill. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the biggest factor that determines somebody's lifespan is their zip code. And lucky for Eldred, bringing parks and healthy food into neighborhoods can be done without bringing border politics into the mix. Megan Burks, KPBS News. Heather Berner also contributed to this story with support from the Dennis A. Hunt Fund for Health Journalism. A new federal policy changes the way some undocumented migrants will get their green card when married to a U.S. citizen. Peggy Pico finds out what it means to San Diego families. The policy change takes effect in March. It aims to keep families together during the lengthy process of obtaining a green card for spouses and children of American citizens. Raquel Coronado is one of tens of thousands in the U.S. who will be affected by this change. Also with this is Jacob Supashnik, a San Diego immigration attorney. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, Jacob, you. right now, undocumented immigrants married to U.S. citizens must return to their home country for a, a period of time and wait sometimes months or years to get their green card. What does this new policy change do? How, how does it make that different? Well, the policy still requires them to leave the U.S., but just by way of introduction, most people who are undocumented and residing in the U.S., they are not able to finish the process inside the U.S. They need to leave the U.S. and face the U.S. Embassy in their home countries. And if they overstayed and they stayed here more than uh, certain years, they have to get a waiver to be able to come back. Under the old rules, the waiver was applicable at the end of the process, but this new change allowed them to do the waiver before they depart the U.S., which will reduce the amount of time they're going to be separated from their families. Okay, and Raquel, you've kind of experienced this uh, firsthand, or at least you've applied uh, for a waiver. What is your situation? Our situation right now is, you know, we've been in this process for about three years now, and we're, uh, we recently applied for a parole in place um, through the, with, it helps the military, it helps military families. Um. So you're married to, tell me who you're married to, you have children, how long have you I, been married? I am married to Yancy Nunez and together we have two, two beautiful children and we've been together for seven years and married six. And uh, he's in the military. He is. He is currently it, in now the there's, Army. There's a, a military waiver that's very similar to this, the parole, I, I think. Parole. 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 Right. Place, and yes. so um, why should military families maybe also apply to this uh, for this civilian waiver? Um, I think if your parole in place does get denied for, you know, for obvious reasons, I think it will be um, very um, helpful if we have this new law that we we are currently, you know, really apply for it, you know, and it will be a great help. One of, one of the situations, your friends had this where she, she she was married or they were both military, somebody was deployed and there was no one to take care of the children? Actually, um, there were just regular um, civilians, mm -hmm. there were a civilian family and both of them went to Juarez and they faced um, a tremendous hardship down there with both of their kids and he, she ended up returning back to the U.S. and he stayed in Mexico. Oh, okay. Yes. And, and But on that note, military, Jacob, can right. absolutely uh, be deployed and then the person's back, uh, the, the other spouse is in their home country and then who takes care of the exactly. children? Separation. And then just a note on the parole in place, while it's a good process for military, it's not guaranteed. And so now we, there, the families like this have hope that if, the, if this doesn't work, then they can apply for the waiver inside the U.S., be together with the family, with the kids. And once it's approved, they're hoping that they're going to go out to the embassy and get their, their waiver. And this is called a, a hardship a waiver, but what other eligibility uh, requirements? This is not a blanket, oh, get back no, into the U.S. No. free card. What it is, it's, it, it's very important to understand that the waiver only applies to people that came here without uh, authorization and, overstay and stayed uh, longer than they're supposed to. And the waiver only waives the legal stay. It doesn't waive a criminal uh, issue. It doesn't waive uh, misrepresentation. And so it's very important to show that if they have a reentry or if they committed a crime, the waiver is not going to help them. So they have to be married to a U.S. citizen. They can only show that they came here uh, unauthorized and stayed here, never left, and that they are a person of good moral character. And hopefully with that, and they have to show extreme hardship to the U.S. citizen spouse. 
Rukha, what, what would you say uh, if you had advice to people who are in a similar situation? Should they apply now? How soon should they apply? You Now that you're experienced in this, what would your advice be to them? I would tell them to get out. You know, most of, most of the people who are in similar cases are afraid of coming out of, you know, and telling, you know, hey, you know, I need help with my illegal, you know, status and stuff. And I think it's very important. We, my husband and I, it took us, I think about three years to finally put in um, the I-130 to, to begin with the process. And we were afraid, but we had the courage to, to come out and, and start this process All together. Right. And Jacob, so start early. Uh, yes. Jacob, just one quick question I was interested in is, yeah. um, how does our waiver and our policies when it comes to undocumented immigrant uh, marriages to a citizen of sure. a country compare to other countries, let's say Canada, England, things like that? Well, I think, you know, the U.S. Uh, has a policy, a strict policy against people coming here without authorization. And that's why the waiver is in place in a way, it's, it's, it's kind of like a punishment where they need to leave and be able to pay the price and come back. Many other countries like Canada, the rules are a bit lax. In Europe, is if you're, as long as you're married to a, a national of the country and you can prove that you're not a criminal, there are more, much more ways to be able to get your documents. The U.S. make, make it a policy to say, we're going to make sure that you do it the right way, and even if you're married to a U.S. citizen, we have to make you do some things to avoid the floodgates. All right. So I still think we are quite tough compared to more, other countries. More conservative Absolutely. to some, some other countries. Absolutely. We are out of time, so uh, folks at home can hear a lot more about this uh, immigration waiver sure. on our website, kpbs.org. Thank you both for talking with Thank us. Thank you so much for having us. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.